Your generous support makes this ministry possible. Thank you. Okay, we are looking at the, uh, the doctrine of the rapture of the church. And this is a disputed doctrine, and we are looking at the question of when the rapture will take place. Will the rapture of the church take place before the Great Tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, or will it take place after the uh, the uh, rapture, Daniel's 70th week. We're uh, looking at this phrase in uh, Revelation 3.10, uh, I will keep you out of the hour of trial that is about to come upon the whole inhabited earth. Uh, we looked at that, that phrase a little bit and I think that we were then looking at a passage, the only other passage where you have that verb and that preposition, I, uh, I will keep you out of or keep out of, the only other passage where it is found is in John 17 and verse 15. And I think I had given uh, a little bit of the argument that is sometimes used from that passage where Christ says, I do not pray that you... Uh, take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. And some post-tribulationalists have said, do you see what that has as far as relevance for, the, for uh, Revelation 3.10? Uh, we are not to be kept out of the world. We are not to be kept out of the tribulation but that we are to be preserved from the evil one. Preserved from the evil uh, of the tribulation. Now, that is really not understanding the context of John 17. And we started to look at that last time. Uh, and to look at the context, you need to start with verses 11 and 12 where Jesus says, uh, as he is leaving his disciples, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now you notice, I was guarding them, and none of them perished. That's the issue. That's what the guarding involves. It involves keeping them so that none of them perish. This is not keeping from temptation. This is not, okay, uh, while they are in the world, I will guard them and preserve them and keep them from temptation uh, so that they do not fall. But they're still going to be in the world and they're still going to be subject to the temptation. This is the issue of eternal destiny. None of them perished. Why? Because I was keeping them. And so Christ is praying in John 17, now I am going away and I will no longer be here for me to continue to keep them. And so I pray, Father, that you keep them. I do not ask that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. When he says keep them from the evil one, the subject is eternal destiny. Keep them from perishing. And so keep them from the evil one means keep them from apostasy. Uh, this is not protection from temptation. Now, when he says, I pray that you keep them from the evil one. This is a prayer for total exclusion from the evil one. He's not praying behalf 
in, uh, in me and half in the evil one. He is praying that they would be kept completely from the evil one, that they would be kept from perishing. Now, how is that prayer answered? Look at verses 21 and 23 of John 17. 21. He prays that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, that they may be in us. Verse 23. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Do you see what Christ is saying here in this passage? Everyone is either in Christ or is in the evil one. There are only two positions. Everyone is in Christ or is in the evil one. When he says, I pray that you keep them from the evil one, he is praying that they be kept from apostasy. Colossians 1.13 shows how this prayer was answered. Paul says that you, translate, you transferred them, that you transferred us from the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We are no longer in Satan's kingdom. We are no longer in the evil one. We are in Christ. And this is a prayer that we be kept safe in Christ. Now, if that's the meaning of John 17 and verse 15, uh, keep from, what does it mean in Revelation uh, 3.10? Keep them from the hour of trial. That means total exclusion from the hour of trial. Not just preservation, protection in the midst of, it means total exclusion from the hour of trial. That means that believers will not be in the hour of trial at all. Revelation 3.10 is a very strong and good promise that the believer is uh, the church, the church at Philadelphia, and we said the whole church will not be in the hour of trial. Notice, Revelation 3.10 says, um, I will keep you from the, what? The hour of trial. That's not just from the time, the, the, uh, the trial. It says, I will keep you from even the, the time period, the hour of, of trial. So, uh, there are two things that post-tribulationalists have to water down when they look at this verse in Revelation, in Revelation 3.10. They water down, they water down, first of all, the promise. Uh, they do not have the keeping out of the hour of trial. They do really do not have the Lord keeping us out of the hour of trial. And the second thing that they water down is the tribulation itself, the trial. What's the tribulation going to be like? Do you remember what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew uh, chapter 24 and verse 21? He says, For then there will be great tribulation, Now, do you remember the rest of the verse? Such as never been in the past and never will be in the future. Have you read anything about what Hitler's Germany was like in the persecution of the Jews? Have any of you had the course on the Holocaust? That may be be offered... uh, this, uh, this, this coming semester. That's something that, uh, that everyone should, uh, should do a study of uh, because it just it shows how 
how evil man can be in his inhumanity to man. It, it is awful. Uh, or it was awful. But do you know what Jesus said? The great tribulation is going to be far worse. It's going to be far worse. And, and so what, what the post-tribulationalist has to do is uh, water down the tribulation because believers will not be subject or will not be excluded from the sufferings and the trials of the, of the tribulation. Uh, look at Revelation chapter 6 and verses 9 to 11. Revelation 6, verses 9 to 11. It says, uh, when, I opened, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the so souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? You see, here you have believers that are slain during the tribulation. Um, in uh, Revelation 7, verses 9 to, uh, to 17, you have the multitudes of saints who suffered uh, during the great tribulation. Chapter 15, verses 1 to, 13, 1 to 3, you have those who were slain by the beast. Robert Gundry, a post-tribulationalist, admits that the tribulation is going to be a time of great persecution and death for Christians. And what he says, the tribulation of the 70th week has to do not with God's wrath against sinners, but with the wrath of Satan, the Antichrist, and the wicked against the saints. So he says that the saints are going to suffer greatly during the, during the tribulation. Many are going to be persecuted. Many are going to be slain. Well, if that is true, if many are going to die during this time of persecution, then in what way do you really have God protecting them during the tribulation, as Revelation 3.10 says, I will keep you out of the hour of trial that is about to come upon the whole inhabited earth. What kind of protection are, are they really given if, if so many are going to be slain? So, Post-tribulationalists wind up having a tribulation which is not as bad as Scripture pictures and a deliverance which is not as good as Scripture pictures. So, we have been looking at what? We have been looking at one passage under the category of a scriptural argument for pre-tribulationalism. Uh, we're asking, are there specific passages that not say, we're not saying that they say the church is going to be raptured before the tribulation. Those wor words are not specific, specifically found. But here is a passage that indicates that the church will not go through the tribulation, that they will be kept out of the hour of trial, that they will be kept out of the tribulation. There's one other verse that we should look at in this regard, and that is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10. And that says that Christ, uh, 
or that God has not appointed us unto wrath, but unto the obtaining of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us in order that whether we are uh, awake or whether we sleep, we might live together with him. Now, that verse says that God has not appointed us unto wrath, but unto the obtaining of salvation. Now, what, what does that verse have to do with uh, the question of the rapture? Well, what is the wrath that is in view here? The tribulation is a time of wrath. You also have in the, in the New Testament, God's eternal judgment is referred to as his, as his wrath. So which is the, is the wrath of God that is in view here? Is it the wrath of the final judgment? Or is it the wrath of the tribulation? The term wrath applies to both. Now how do we answer a question like that? What is the primary hermeneutical rule, the primary rule of interpretation. Interpret according to the context. What's the second rule of interpretation? Interpret according to the context. What's the third rule of interpretation? Interpret according to the context. Now, what is the context that we are looking at here in Revelation 5, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5? Now, if you look at verses one, uh, 2 and 3, notice what Paul says, For you know accurately that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the light, night. For when they say peace and security, then sudden destruction comes upon them as birth pains to the pregnant woman, and they shall by no means escape. You see what the chapter is talking about? It's talking about the day of the Lord. It's talking about that period at the end of the age when the day of the Lord will, will bring the judgment of God and the wrath of God here upon, upon the earth. So the, the, the context would say that this is the wrath of the, of the day of the Lord. And when it says that uh, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to the obtaining of salvation, that would not be eternal salvation. That would be salvation or deliverance from the wrath of the day of the Lord. This would not be a soteriological use of the term salvation. It would be a deliverance from the, the, uh, the day of the Lord. You have that kind of use in, in, uh, in Luke 171, where it talks about salvation or deliverance from the hand of our enemies. Now, what's the point? What's the point? You see what Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians 5? It is utterly incongruous. It is inconsistent. It, is, it, it just does not fit. It does not fit for the church to suffer the wrath of the day of the Lord. We have been justified, we have been sanctified, we have been joined to Christ, we belong to him. How can the church suffer the wrath of the day of the Lord? Paul says, we have not been appointed to wrath. We have been appointed to the obtaining of salvation. Now, if you're a post-tribulationalist, how, how are you going to deal with that? Um, the answer of the post-tribulationalist is that uh, is is the claim that the tribulation 
is not the wrath of God, it is the wrath of man. It is the wrath of Satan, it is the wrath of the Antichrist, it is the wrath of uh, the ungodly who dwell on the earth. It is their wrath against the saints that the believers are going to suffer during the, during the tribulation. What's the answer to that? Look at Revelation chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Revelation chapter 6 looks at the seal or, or the uh, yeah, the seal judgments. And when you come to the sixth seal, verses 16 and 17, Verse 15, the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and every slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? Do you see what that is saying? The tribulation is the judgment of God. These seals come forth from the Lamb who opens the seals, who opens the book. And they are the wrath of God that is being poured out in judgment on uh, the earth in 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 these end days. This is the wrath of God. So, 1 Thessalonians, verses, uh, chapter 5 and verses 9 and 10, we have not been appointed to wrath. And that's the, the context of the day of the Lord. But for obtaining salvation. Notice also a very interesting statement in verse, in verse 10. Christ died for us in order that whether we are awake, or whether we sleep, we might live together with him. Who are those who are awake, and who are those who sleep? What do we do? We interpret according to the context. Now, what's interesting here is that the word for sleeping, the word for sleeping is not the same word that is used in chapter 4. You notice in chapter 4 and verse verse 13, we do not wish you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who sleep. The Greek word for sleep in chapter 4 What's that referring to? Huh? It's referring to believers who have died. And the word that is used in chapter 4 is koimao. Koimao. We get our word cemetery from it. The word that is used in chapter 5 is, in, is not the word koimao. It's a different word. It's the word katheldo. And that word in chapter 5 has been used earlier in the chapter in verse 6. So then, let us not be, not, let us not sleep as the rest, but let us be watchful and let us be sober. What is Paul talking about in chapter 5? He is talking about uh, those who are, are not watchful. Those who are believers who are not being sober, they are carnal, they are not being watchful, they are not looking for the coming of the Lord. And what he is saying is in verse 10, whether we are watching or whether we are sleeping, whether we are vigilant as Christians, whether we are sober and watching and looking for the coming of the Lord, or 
whether we are not, whether we are sleeping, whether we are, are slothful as Christians. Slothful. Is that a word that anybody uses anymore? <laughs> whether we are, are lazy and, uh, and, and not fulfilling our, our, our calling as believers we still will live together with him. That doesn't mean that, uh, that vigilance is unimportant. But it does indicate that our hope is certain. That even carnal believers will be with the Lord. I think that this is a verse which indicates that there will be no partial rapture. Okay, we are looking at arguments for a pre-tribulational rapture. We have been looking under the category of scriptural arguments. Two passages. What are they? Revelation 3.10 and 1 Thessalonians 5. Verses 9 and 10. The stronger passage would be your, your Revelation 3.10. Uh, in the, uh, in the, the new book on the rapture with the three different views, Craig Blasing uses as one of his main arguments the passage from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, there's another kind of argument that we need to look at. And this category of arguments is what we would call theological arguments. Not only do we have specific promises uh, that say that the church will not experience the tribulation or go through the tribulation, but there are, there are differences when you look at the passages that speak of Christ's coming for the church, passages that speak of the rapture. Now, what are our two central passages on the rapture? Come on. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Those two passages specifically are speaking about Christ coming for the church. And they say that when he comes, we will all be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. We will be changed. We will be glorified. If you go back in the notes to page two, we listed a number of things that will happen when Christ comes for the church. And the church is raptured. Christ will descend. Uh, we will be Change. The dead in Christ will rise for, first. Living believers will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. We will be changed, which involves we will be, become immortal. We will be glorified uh, instantly. Uh, all believers, all believers, we will not all sleep, Paul says, but we will all be changed. And uh, we will meet the Lord in the air, and Paul and and First Thessalonians says, and we will forever be with the Lord. Those are some of the things that specifically are said to take place at the time of the rapture. Now, what will happen? What will happen when Christ comes in power and glory at the end of the tribulation? Now. Can you give me a central passage that speaks about Christ's post-tribulational coming in power and glory? Huh? Revelation 19 is one. Revelation 19. And then there is a central passage in the teaching of Christ, the Olivet Discourse. The Olivet Discourse, and that is found in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. 
And the argument that we are using here is that when you compare these passages about the rapture with those passages that speak of his coming at the end of the tribulation, there are significant differences so that those two events cannot take place at the same time. Uh, Now, uh, Matthew 24 and 25, which speaks of Christ's coming at the end of the tribulation, a couple of things that are specifically said in Matthew 24 and 25. In uh, Matthew 24 and verse 30, uh, Christ will come in power and great glory. Uh, and then it says in verse in chapter 25 um, and verse 31 that when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, so this clearly links it with the coming in chapter 24. When he comes, then he will sit on his glorious throne and he will judge the nations. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. So you have Christ coming He sits on his throne and he judges. He judges the nations. And he separates sheep from goats. Who are the sheep? Those are believers. Those are believers who are alive on the earth at the end of the tribulation. Who are the goats? They are the unbelievers who are alive when he comes. And uh, so, believers here will be separated from unbelievers at this judgment. And then, if you look at what it says, to believers, he says, in verse 34, the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Believers will enter into the kingdom. What will happen to The unbelievers, verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Unbelievers are judged. They suffer eternal eternal punishment. Now, the first argument, the first argument I want to give as a theological argument, is that there must be an interval of time between the rapture and the second coming. There must be an interval of time between the rapture and the second coming. And there are three different passages and three different kinds of arguments that can be used to support this. Okay? Now, look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14 and verses 2 and 3. John 14. Christ is in the upper room with his disciples. He is about to leave them. And he is preparing them for this in the in the upper room. And he says in chapter 14, Let you, not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. He says, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now, when he says, I will come again and receive you to myself, 
This is a reference to the second coming. This is not a reference to Christ coming for believers at death. Uh, in, uh, in, in the New Testament, it never says when a believer dies that Christ comes for us. It always say, says that we go to be with him. So, it says, this is what Paul is saying in uh, Philippians chapter 1. He has a desire to depart and to be with Christ. Um, but this is, that, that's at death. Uh, this is not what we have here. We depart to be with Christ when we die. This is Christ coming for us at the uh, at, at, at his second coming, the rapture. Now, when he comes, when he comes, what is he going to do? What is he going to do with us? What does it say? He is going to go and he is going to receive us to himself. Where? What is the context saying? I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that you may be where I am also. The clear implication of the context is that he is going to come for us and he is going to take us to that place that he has prepared for us in, in heaven. Now, if you are a post-tribulationalist, if you're a post-tribulationalist, when do you get to that place that Christ has prepared? If you're a post-tribulationalist, Christ comes again, we are caught up to be with him. What happens? Huh? We come right back down, and then what happens? We reign with Christ for a thousand years here upon the earth. When do you get to this place that Christ is prepared? Not for another thousand years. Not for a th another thousand years. Why does he mention here this place that he is preparing? What, what I am saying is that the going are going to the Father's house. I will come again. I will receive you to myself. The going to the Father's house must precede the coming of Christ to the earth at the end of the tribulation. Now, how long that will be is not clear. All I'm arguing is that there must be an interval of time between, between the two. Now, a second argument. I like this argument better. I like this argument better. And that is, an interval of time is required by the separation that takes place at the, at the rapture. Now, if you look at 1 Thessalonians 4, what happens when Christ comes for believers? Believers who have died, what does 1 Thessalonians 4 say? Huh? The dead in Christ will rise first. Then what happens to believers who are, who are alive? We are caught up. That's where our word rapture comes from. We are caught up to be with the Lord in the air. So all believers who have died, rise. All believers who are living upon the earth are caught up to be with the, with the Lord. Now, that means 30 seconds after the rapture, who is left on the earth? Huh? Unbelievers. Only unbelievers. After, after 
the rapture. There will only be unbelievers who are left on the earth. Come back to Matthew 24 and 25. Matthew 25, the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Where do the goats come, or where do the sheep come from? Those are believers who are on the earth at the time of Christ's second coming. You have the separation of believers and unbelievers after Christ comes and he sits on his throne and judges. Uh, After the rapture, there are no sheep. There are no believers to be who are left on the earth. What we are saying is that there must be a period of time after the rapture before the second coming in which the gospel will be preached and other people come to know the Lord who will be saved during the tribulation, who will be believers, who will be the sheep, that will be here on the earth at the time of the the second coming of Christ. So this is an argument from the separation that takes place at the time of the rapture. Now, I think that this is a significant argument. It doesn't tell us how long. This argument does not tell us how long that interval must be. Uh, But it does tell us that the rapture and Christ's coming at the end of the tribulation can't take place at the at the same time. Douglas Moo was asked on a panel uh, when uh, we had he is the post tribulationalist. He was asked, "Where do the where do the believers come from who enter into the into the millennium?" Uh, where do the people come from who enter into the millennium? And he said, uh, that's, that's, that's a problem that he's still struggling with and does not have a... Uh, he didn't think that he had a good answer for it. Some people have, have taken, I think, misunderstood a verse that is found in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. And uh, it says in verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. It's an indication here that during the tribulation, the Antichrist is going to be empowered by Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, I think that what that passage is saying is that those who, uh, who saw the truth, understood the truth, had an opportunity to receive the truth and clearly rejected it, that for them, they will have no further opportunity for repentance. But that does not mean everyone. There are vast numbers, there are vast numbers who have not clearly seen the truth. And if you look at Revelation chapter 7, you have an indication that there is going to be a a not only the 144,000, but you have a great multitude there who uh, will come to, come to belief during the, the time of the tribulation. So there will, be, there will be a lot of sheep. There will be a lot of sheep. There will be a lot of, of, uh, of believers. The tribulation is a time of judgment, but it is also a great time of, of salvation. So what we're arguing is that uh, if believers have all been caught up to be with the Lord, none are on the earth after the, after the rapture, and yet at the end of the, 
of the tribulation when Christ comes in power and glory. There are a lot of believers here left on the earth. Where do they come from? There must be an interval of time.